Creator Jesus Christus, Vatican and World News. In the headlines this Saturday, April the 17th, the Vatican Secretary for Relations with States pays tribute to Prince Philip of Edinburgh. Christians in Germany kick off the annual Week for Life initiative, focused this year on care for the dying. And Cardinal Peter Turkson sends circus artists a message of solidarity and encouragement on World Circus Day as the pandemic impacts their lives and livelihoods. In the Vatican, I'm Linda Bordoni. On the day in which the funeral of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh and husband of England's Queen Elizabeth II, takes place, the Vatican Secretary for Relations with States can celebrate a prayer service in the Prince's honour at Rome's Anglican Church of All Saints. Aged 99, Prince Philip died on the 9th of April. In his homily, Archbishop Paul Richard Gallagher recalled the Prince's honourable and faithful service to the Queen, his country and the world. Francesca Merlo tells us more. Speaking at a service in remembrance of Prince Philip at the All Saints Anglican Church in Rome, Archbishop Paul Richard Gallagher opened his homily by citing a poem in which a forest scene is described. Archbishop Gallagher noted that the forest described in the poem would be full of immense trees of different varieties. He noted that the presence of these trees is always taken for granted, but should there ever be a gap, that will take an eternity to fill. The passing of Prince Philip is such an event in the forest of our contemporary history and society, said Archbishop Gallagher. He described Prince Philip as being a constant, always there, a few steps behind, but always present. The Duke of Edinburgh, husband of Queen Elizabeth, died on the 9th of April, aged 99. Prince Philip was present in so many ways and on so many occasions and scenes, said Archbishop Gallagher, adding that, however, for most of us he has remained indelibly, through many changes and years, the Prince Consort, a role, not an office, at the side of a Queen who reigns but does not rule. Prince Philip's achievements are remarkable, continued Archbishop Gallagher. He spoke of the Prince's naval career and noted that he was patron of over 800 charities and organisations. The first years of Elizabeth and Philip's marriage, particularly in Malta, are believed to have been very happy, almost carefree, he said. The latter was to change upon the death of the king in 1952, when the princess Elizabeth was 26 years old. From that moment on until his death, Philip was always there, noted Archbishop Gallagher, and it is clear that the Duke shared the Queen's commitment to the Commonwealth. Bringing his homily to a close, Archbishop Gallagher noted that indeed Prince Philip lived a life of multiple contrasts, and some could be reconciled only with difficulty, while others understandably provoked resentment and pain. However, he continued, the faith we celebrate this Easter cuts through all that, resolving differences and enlightening darkness and dissipating doubts. For the naval commander, the consort, the father of a great family, for the leader in benevolence and education, the battle is over, and all is quiet again in the forest, concluded Archbishop Gallagher. The great tree may have fallen, but it leaves its mark and encourages fresh growth towards the heavens. I'm Francesca Merlo. Pope Francis and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, this week shared their opinions regarding the need to protect and promote the millions of people who are forced to flee their homes. During a private audience on Friday, the Pope handed Grandi a signed copy of his message for the the 54th World Day of Peace and spoke of his concern over the extent of global humanitarian emergencies. The High Commissioner highlighted the importance of strengthening cooperation between the Holy See and the UNHCR, and then spoke to Vatican Radio about the meeting. Uh, It was a a very important meeting because, of course, the Holy Father is probably today in the world one of the greatest champions of the cause of the most vulnerable, and in particular of uh, refugees and migrants. So I really came to Rome to see him, to draw strength and inspiration, and uh, I did receive strength and inspiration from this important meeting. We discussed uh, challenges of uh, refugee protection around the world, uh, the the difficult context, uh, increasing conflicts, uh, other causes of flight of people. We discussed specific areas, Central America, the flight of Venezuelans in uh, South American countries. We discussed Lebanon, 
countries uh, going through a difficult crisis. We discussed uh, Europe and uh, the necessity for Europe to equip itself with an instrument to deal with uh, population movements that uh, can help Europe overcome all the uh, shortcomings that uh, member states are facing now. So this and, and, and other um, uh, topics were the subject of our conversation, but most importantly, I, I found once again in, in the message of the Pope that uh, inspiration that we all need uh, to be better in how we deal with others and especially the poorest. And that was Filippo Grandi, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, speaking to Vatican News. The collapse of the global economy has contributed to worsening conditions for the very poor in the Caribbean nation of Haiti. Father Richard Threchet, a priest and medical doctor whose work in Haiti is supported by the Humanitarian Rabba Foundation, spoke with Vatican News about the effects of the pandemic in one of the poorest countries in the world. The main way that coronavirus has negatively impacted the condition of people, at least in our experience in Haiti, is because of the collapsed global economy. So fundraising is decreased. Funds which are sent to us are decreased. I have to really insist and help you understand that money we receive from abroad is subsidy in order to make us do something that's really uh, good and noble for the people, which is the creation of work or different kinds of, of uh, small businesses which help people to live. So it's not charity that now we have no charity. The, it's that we have no subsidy now, and without the subsidy, a lot of things have totally fallen. It's our experience. Our experience is not small. And I'm sure it's compounded across the country, but this has been the increase in poverty and hardship of living because of the COVID around the world, which has caused the collapse of a global economy and the decrease, enormous decrease in funds sent to organizations which are trying to help people in a dignified way by subsidy. Father Richard Frechette in Haiti there speaking to Vatican News. And starting today, Christian churches in Germany are, con are celebrating their 26th ecumenical week for life. The week has been organized since 1994 by the Catholic Bishops' Conference, together with the Evangelical Church of Germany, to raise awareness in the church and larger society of the dignity of every human life. This year's edition, which was postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, is focused on the theme Life When Dying, which was inspired by a fundamental change in the German legal framework concerning the right to life. Auxiliary Bishop of Augsburg, Anton Lozinger, spoke to Vatican News about the initiative. In this year, actually, the corona pandemic demands many measures of social distancing for our society. They are necessary to protect life and make us aware how essential it is to accompany vulnerable people. Consequently, Concern for the seriously ill and the dying is a focus of this year's Ecumenical Week for Life of the German Bishops' Conference and the Evangelical Church in Germany. Using the motto, Life in Dying, the week is dedicated to the pastoral, medical and ethical aspects of a dignified end-of-life care. So, in this context of the current debate on assisted suicide, informing people about the many alternative possibilities of hospice and palliative care takes on a special significance. The Auxiliary Bishop of Augsburg, Anton Lozinger, speaking there to Vatican News. And in other news, Brazil's ex-president Lula now has a clear run to contest the top job once again, following his corruption convictions having been quashed by the country's Supreme Court. James Blears reports that the sitting president now faces the prospect of a real political fight on his hands. 
Brazil's Supreme Court has annulled the corruption convictions of former President Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva by a majority ruling. The turning of the tide began in March with one of their judges, Edson Fachin. He determined that a federal court who tried Lula didn't have the legal jurisdiction to handle the case. This was immediately appealed by Brazil's top prosecutor, but unsuccessfully. Now, with this latest vote, the case has been overturned via procedure. Sitting President Jair Bolsonaro has announced that he's going to seek re-election and run for a second term. He now has a powerful opponent in Lula, who led the country between 2003 and 2010. Brazil has been exceptionally hard hit by the pandemic, which has killed more than 365,000 people. The death toll is only second to that of the United States. Bolsonaro's performance in combating it has been widely criticized. He mistakenly described COVID-19 as a little flu, didn't wear a mask very often, and he, as well as his wife, contracted it. Lula seized upon all of this, criticizing Bolsonaro's response as imbecilic. Lula, aged 75, insists that the Supreme Court decision fully vindicates him. Bolsonaro, who's nine years younger, has gone on the political attack, criticizing Lula and saying that people can draw their own conclusions. This will indeed happen with the presidential election in October next year. Current polls indicate it could well be neck and neck. For Vatican Radio, James Blair's reporting. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit almost every sector of the economy, including the circus industry. On today's World Circus Day, the Vatican sent a message to the World Circus Federation expressing its closeness with circus artists and the industry and hoping an explosion of joy and cherished balm of laughter of the circus will soon return. Robin Gomes reports. I ask circus performers of all latitudes who are suffering so much during this pandemic to bring their art as soon as possible to the places where children and the elderly suffer, said Cardinal Peter Turkson, the prefect of the Vatican Dicastery for promoting integral human development. Grandparents and children are the most frequent spectators under the circus tent and are unfortunately the ones who have paid a very high price. They are as thirsty as circus workers for an explosion of pure joy, such as the one offered by the circus. Those who are so nobly taking care of their health also need the cherished balm of laughter, the Cardinal wrote in a message for the 11th World Circus Day, April the 17th. In the message addressed to Urs Pils, president of the World Circus Federation, the Cardinal noted that the protracted emergency situation and bans on gatherings have threatened the very existence of circus industry and its businesses, which often are family managed, forcing them to go into debt in the hope of seeing better times. He urged for financial support for them from the European Union and each country. He pointed out that during this time, small and great spontaneous or organized actions have been carried out by parishes and dioceses through caritas and Catholic charitable organizations who have also responded to circus people's requests for survival. Echoing the call of Pope Francis for solidarity and inclusion, Cardinal Turkson said, We are on the same boat, all of us fragile and disoriented. But at the same time, it is important and needed that all of us row together, each of us in need of comforting the other. He said the Pope encourages us to avoid indifference and live this time like the Good Samaritan, a model to build real and new relationships with others. I am Robin Gomes. That's all from us this evening. Thanks to Roberto Colangeli. I'm Linda Bodoni. Bye-bye.